A quick disclaimer, opinions of host and guest do not represent the views or opinions of functional movement systems. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. This general information is not intended to replace your healthcare professional. Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Your ankles and your feet. They are the connection between you and the ground and the foundation of so many different movements. With that said, the importance of a functional base is often overlooked. Today, the guys get into ankle injuries, deep squatting, and ideas to improve ankle mobility. We discuss balance beam work, the need to get past temporary fixes, and how the culture you were raised in can influence your mobility. And finally, we close the show with another fireside chat with Gray. So pop a squat and join us for today's movement podcast, powered by FMS. So, Gray, um, you came to me, I guess, it, you know, looking back now, it's probably your New Year's resolution. You came to me back in January, probably early mid-January, right when everybody's coming back in and kind of kicking off the new year. And you said, uh, Lee, I just want you to know, and everybody, just tell everybody here, I'm only going to be in the office a couple of days a week. I want to stay away a couple of days a week. And I thought, I was like, the hell's the difference the last five years? <laughs> it's like, are you, are you telling me or are you telling yourself? Because I don't know when you're coming in or when you're going out. And it's kind of like it when you're not around. But, you know, I know you're not in the, you're in the office a little bit more these days. But I think, I, I got to think that goes back to one thing we've been kicking around, more awareness. <laughs> I think you want to give yourself a little bit more awareness. You know, maybe I should be at the office a little bit more this year and be more consistent. Well, I'm not when, sure that's happened, but when I'm here, I wanted to be here more like a hundred percent instead of eighty five percent. And I realize oh, I've only eighty five percent. You're giving yourself about fifty percent. I've only got about three days a hundred percent for you. So the other two days, <laughs> I just decided true. all the sandbag and Indian club training I was doing during hunting season that I got to get out in the woods and be a lumberjack before the ticks come out because you know going to get Lyme disease. Lumber, again. You're gonna you're gonna lumberjack. Ever I think, since I had that discussion with you about my Tuesday, Thursday absence, I've been running <laughs> a chainsaw and snaking logs with a four-wheeler and wearing a flannel shirt. So <laughs> That's how you yeah. define lumberjack. <laughs> and I have not cut myself yet. Now, I'm wearing those little chaps. Driving your really nice Ford F-150 <laughs> <laughs> down to your farm about 15 minutes to cut a couple of trees down. Danielle looked at my chainsaw chaps. And there's a cut. Chainsaw chaps. Yeah, they're orange Good and they got God. fiberglass in them. And there was so, a huge slice through my left thigh. And she goes, she goes, is that your safety gear? And I'm like, yeah, and it works too. Cause that was a you're femoral still artery. <laughs> yeah, you're still, you're still alive and kicking. Yep. So what are we getting into? Talking about the foot and the ankle. I think the foundation of everything uh, today, huh? Well, is obviously as we both started off in athletic training, the most catastrophic. But one of us only kind of got to the finish line with that. I didn't take the test. I was already in <laughs> PT school. It's like if you're <laughs> in medical school, why go back and become a paramedic? I mean, uh, so no, I, I didn't have the hours. I, I, I had all the classes. I didn't have the hours. But the point is, in high school, the most prevalent thing you're going to see is a foot ankle injury. It may not be as devastating as the kid that has a horrible low back problem or a concussion or an ACL, but you're going to see the volume of ankles. And I think that goes to how is our, our foundation challenged in growth and development? We go through a growth spurt. And how does a myopic approach to sports or a sedentary approach, moving too much can be pretty hard on your foot and ankle and not moving enough can be equally hard on your foot and ankle because athletes who overtrain seem to lose their deep squat and kids who sit too much seem to lose their deep squat. And you can always see a lot of foot and ankle problem associated with that. Not just the cause, but, but the foot and ankle suffer when somebody is doing everything else and they lose their squat. It just, and it's, it's part of why we got into screening and looking more movement through patterns instead of parts. Right. I mean, the, the injury certainly can set it off, but as you said, just being sedentary, not using it. When, 
when do you use the ankle most often in everyday activities? Walking. Walking. And if you sit all day, what do you really not use a lot of? Your hips. Your hips become a little bit tight. So when you take a stride, and when you take a stride and you start to go and you start trying to use hip mobility and don't have it, then what do you then lack? You don't use your ankle as well. That's right. Now, if you don't have ankle mobility, you're not going to use your hip as well. It goes back to it's like kind of the chicken or the egg, right? One, one's going to drive the other. And if you don't have ankle mobility, you're probably going to lose some hip mobility. You don't have hip mobility, you're going to lose ankle mobility. So it's, all, it's still all connected is really my point. But if you, if you, don't, have that, if you don't have that input and, and that feel of the ground, that's why it's the foundation, everything else can change and be screwed up. Well, you know, it was pretty, pretty vogue, uh, last maybe eight years on the road, you heard glued. Can activity. the lumberjacks say vogue? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not Dude, sure. I can, I can cross over. I can survive in almost any environment. Adaptability is the key. Look like you've been there before, man. Vogue. Go back to that. Okay. People talking glute activation programs, re- correctives, glute activation. And I, I hear people talking about this because a lot of people... There's a certified glute specialist now. Dude, I saw that too. That just makes me sad. There's, there's not much more we need to say. The only thing... But what's the problem? Some... What is the problem with that? Is the, the well, assumption I mean, is you, all you need to do is glute You got activation. a saggy butt and you want to solve it. But my point is, is, is if you're an adult and you can't do a body weight deep squat to a rest position, and you're asking me about glute activation, I would say, get your squat deeper. It'll take care of itself. Now, what's gonna, what are you going to face to do that? You're going to face ankle mobility, tight thighs, tight psoas, a rounded low back. There's a, there's a journey to get that deep squat back once you've lost it. But why would your glute be active? Because the only way to get out of a butt below knees position is with your glutes. Once you're to parallel, your hamstrings can take you from there. All right. So why would we try to puff up a muscle that you decided through your movement patterns you're not going to use? So to your point, if your hips get stiff, it's going to change your gait. Your ankles will probably conveniently stiffen up because there's no reason to maintain mobility. And before you know it, you can't deep squat. But the journey to get the deep squat back fixes the foot, ankle, and hip if you do it right. And if you do it wrong, you're just going to blow the knee because the knee is going to compensate anytime the hip and ankle um, squeeze it between two things that don't want to move. That's why I think walking can be a, a great general approach to start exercising because it is going to force you to do certain things and maybe even put you on the right path to gaining certain things. But you have to... Even if you've, you, at the end of the day, you still have to recognize you may have a stiff ankle. Exactly. And, and I, I, I really like what you said there, because if walking is even a new activity for you, you're going to really up the walking. I would say pick a safe environment first, pretty flat, pretty stable. But Ashley and I were talking a week or two ago mm-hmm. about just getting on uneven terrain and being a little bit more aware and not turning it into a Tabata routine or an interval, but just being aware of how much of a forward lean feels natural on a hill. Or what does it feel like walking sideways on a hill? And before you know it, you will have improved your ankle mobility in a measurable way, and you haven't done one exercise yet. You just have, you change the obstacle. So it's, first of all, it's just getting my walking volume up. And now it's getting your walking adversity up and you adapt. Yeah. So find a track and most, I mean, there's plenty of walking trails in most places around the, around the world. There's, there's a lot of access to tracks around the world. And then as you get comfortable, your mileage starts going up. So instead of just simply increasing your mileage, maybe go walk on a different terrain, a different Mm -hmm. environment. And, and I've always found that, that I can out in a non paved environment, I stay engaged longer. That, that, that may be different for some people, but I stay engaged longer when there's a little bit more variety. And almost there, you're stuck on the road traveling. If there's a river walk next to the hotel, great place to stretch, jog, or just do whatever you got to do. But it's just that, that open space. You can do what you want with it. So. But gener- generally speaking right now, most people, not everybody, but most people have stiff ankles. And again, that stiffness may not be because, meaning you've got to go t- stretch your gastrox out. That's tension or stiffness may be tension. 
So, but the most people right now just aren't using their ankles the way they should. Right. So, and, and I would say, number one, squatting deeply to the very end of your range shouldn't hurt. Number two, you shouldn't have any muscle tension at the bottom of your squat. And let, all right, let me back up. When you say squat deeply, let's make sure people understand what you mean. It's not squatting deep with 800 pounds on your back. I'm it's not even talking exercise. Exactly. I'm You're talking, talking about just like you could squat in a roasted marshmallow. If you've ever seen a baby playing with blocks, they're squatted so deep that even if the diaper's not full, it's bumping the ground. And, and that's my whole point. And they're not just there for a brief second saying, oh, I got to stand up. I'm getting a cramp. They sit down there for a half hour, and then when something engages them, they pop tall and toddle on over somewhere else. My point is, you know, when I'm saying deep squat, I'm talking about roasting a marshmallow at camp. I'm not talking about any type of exercise whatsoever. But when I've done this in an exercise environment, so many people treat the bottom of their squat like they do a plank because they have no other choice. There, there's not this comfortable end to the range of motion. There's just all this tension like, I don't want to be here. And if that's what you feel in a body weight squat, there's a lot of really cool stuff you could do that, that doesn't take a lot. We created a mobility flow with a a half foam roll that'll probably get you there in three weeks. But the point is don't expect it sooner than that. And I would rather you do the, something like those moves twice a day for a short amount of time, than call it your workout. And getting you there is just the first step, Right. I mean, if you're still going out and, and sitting 90% of the day or not walking and all you're doing is the thing to get you to squat, you're not going to maintain it. You're going to lose it every day. You're going to get it, lose it, get it, lose it. So the idea is still to figure out what in your environment, what are some of the behaviors that's causing you to have the stiff ankle, which causes you to have a poor squat. Well, see, there, there's where you bring up a good, good point because I've had this conversation with a lot of great coaches. I do that a lot. You just don't listen. You have to listen. I've got you in this environment right here. You've got to listen to me right now. If you're in the woods and a tree falls and there's nobody else there to hear it, did it make a sound? Uh, That's why, exactly. We're in this environment. you got to listen. <laughs> all right. We've all got these temporary solutions. When, when Kelly started showing the flaw stuff, when we got all these people with different ways to use a foam roll to roll out the muscle tension, if you've got to do that all the time, just so you can do your workout, you're not solving the problem. You're placating it. You're just, you know. So my point is, we. I think a lot of times we will show you what we use as a temporary measure to get us to integrity, and then we remove it and change your program. If if you're still flossing a joint 18 months later, if you still got a foam roll, the same trigger point every Tuesday and Thursday before you do upper back. Training wheels. I'm, I'm, I mean, and the problem is it's going to quit responding soon because you're not solving the problem. You're covering the symptoms. So that's, that's where I think a little bit of good advice to get you over the hump um, can sometimes be somebody's crutch that they insist on training with. And we, we've got to get you off those crutches at some point or you're not walking. You just think you are. So, Yeah, I've actually been dealing with ankle mobility issues for a long time and I've been <laughs> been flossing and you know taking lacrosse ball to it for maybe six years, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> including I've been wearing my Olympic weightlifting shoes, you know, which have their you know one and a half, one and a quarter inch heel, enabling me to squat at all, you know, because if you take the weight off and you take the shoe away and you take all that pre work, I'm not getting down there at all. Um, there's actually something really popular right now. It's called the hashtag Asian Squat Challenge, okay. and it's. It's basically, it's, it's very generalized, but a lot of people, they sit there and they're, they're testing the ability to do this Asian squat, which is like ass to grass. Mm -hmm. And you just watch these people fall over constantly. And they pair it up with a video of a Asian friend who can just squat naturally, like no problem whatsoever. Uh, Do you have any idea as to why? I I definitely think it's culture. If if squatting is accepted in your culture, then more people squat. My my dad was a missionary in Honduras. And when they take a rest break, they just drop down and and squat. All the Americans are looking for a tree stump to sit on. (laughs) And and I used to say, and now these guys in Honduras, they're they're smoking a camel no filter while they're sitting in a perfect deep squat. So their (laughs) lungs are suffering, but their hips are getting better by the second. Um, but I, but I think it's cultural. It's, yeah, it's, I, I agree. Yeah. And again, when you say culture, it doesn't mean that their hips are different and formed all this that way. At some point, I think because of evolution, we may change that 
because we're not using those areas and we are, you know, not squatting, but I think that's exactly it. We, we, we built, go to, go to Home Depot and Lowe's and see how high those toilets are. I've been to China and Asia quite a bit. Their toilets are pretty low. Sometimes they don't even have them. You know, it's a hole in the floor. That's yeah. literally where you go to the bathroom in places in China. There's a hole in the floor. Over here, the toilets are about mid-thigh height. Yep. No, it's, it's, that's, that's what we're seeing. One of the things that I noticed back with the Krauss-Weber test back in the 50s showing the, the American kids were losing these fundamental core patterns mm -hmm. like touching your toes and squatting against kids in different cultures. We also saw the military deleted the deep squat as a shooting position, mm -hmm. because imagine a deep squat with a rifle across your chest. You can shoot uh, to one side from a deep squat, and it's actually faster to go into a deep squat and stand than it is to take a knee. Yeah. So you can become a small target very quickly if you have a deep squat. They deleted the shooting position, uh, I think, between the 50s and the 60s, or maybe it was earlier than that, uh, because we yeah. couldn't get into it. But to me, the solution was right there in front of us. If you've got a military base with a hill, everybody can squat facing downhill. And then they just keep moving to less and less of a gradient until they're back there. And you'd see an 80-20 return of the motion over a two to three week period of simply challenging the, the, the squat on the hill. And for those people who are having difficulty squatting, get on a downward surface until your squat is comfortable and then work your way off that elevation and just experiment with foot position and sitting deeply and breathing and just learning to relax into that position. Don't hear me say tolerate pain. If you're having pain, that's a different thing. But if, if you're just trying to learn to relax, get in a comfortable position with your heels higher than your toes, learn to relax in the squat with as much width or as much narrowness as possible, and then start exploring the limits that you have of getting the heel lower, taking the knees out wider and stuff like that. Play with it for a month. You've got time. <laughs> so. Pain changes movement. The SFMA is a structured, repeatable, movement-based diagnostic system that healthcare professionals use with patients experiencing pain. The SFMA is built around seven fundamental movement patterns and integrates a concept known as regional interdependence how seemingly unrelated problems are actually driving the dysfunction and causing pain. By understanding which patterns to assess further, the clinician develops a differential diagnosis, identifying mobility versus motor control dysfunctions, which allows them to create a more efficient treatment plan. The SFMA is the first system to include diagnosis of motor control dysfunction and provide a systematic approach to reteach the brain proper movement using the neurodevelopmental perspective. Using the SFMA logic, clinicians know exactly where to target their treatments and can easily retest for effectiveness of treatment to return a patient to their activities. Get started today and find a course near you. So a big problem with ankle mobility, Gray, that we, we've kind of we've touched on, and, and we're talking about ankle mobility a lot. Um, we've got a screen in the FMS now, and it's been, been at the forefront of a lot of what many people talk about because it's either – an injury, a past injury in so many people, if you've been an athlete in the past, good chance you sprained your ankle. Or most people just have stiff ankles. And there's no, been no easy solution to, to fixing this problem. Um, and because of the whole entire kinetic chain, it, it, it really setting, setting in motion, you know, your energy and appropriate receptive feedback with the foot, because you can't mention the ankle without talking about the foot. Mm -hmm the foot, the ankle, setting the entire kinetic chain so you can move properly. We've got to, we've got to really start looking at it a little bit differently, and we've got to start thinking about how do we fix it a little bit differently. I, 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 see, where, I, I see where you're going with that, and it's the tip of the iceberg. If, if you have somebody that's got definite ankle mobility issues, I can promise you on an orthopedic exam, they will not be the only mobility issues you find. I'm not saying one's caused or one's correlated. I'm saying stiff ankles are highly associated with usually a generalized stiffness in one or both hips and a generalized stiffness in the T-spine. And this means your knee and your core region are going to have to do things they wouldn't otherwise mm -hmm. have to do. So the ankle is such a good starting point, and, and you will not find ankle problems in gait analysis. People can walk with very little ankle range of motion and fool you as to thinking that they've got good mobility. Put them on a balance beam, 
and it changes. And so that's why a lot of times in a lot of our corrective maneuvers, I will use a balance beam as almost an exercise snack between mobilizations, tape, dry needling of the calf or whatever. I'm not sending you out to exercise. I'm sending you out to challenge the balance beam. But what does that do to the body? I think, I mean, just kind of, kind of give everybody that picture because I know where, I know where you're going with that is when you give somebody, what does the balance beam do to the, do to a person's movement? It forces you to get in line, which makes forces you to balance. It's it the word does. balance beam. Right. So if you like to overpronate instead of dorsiflex, balance beam is going to kick you off. If you don't bend your knees, if you like to go with stiff hamstrings, balance beam is going to throw you off. If you like to walk with your butt all tucked, uh, um, your your core tucked up under you and don't have good hip extension, you're going to fall off the beam. And if you're not falling off the beam, you're going to be flapping your arms like a bird. So just close your eyes and imagine that. And the people who can just sink into that ankle and still keep the foot from pronating are going to walk up and down the beam. There's no reason to close your eyes. Just walk back. And so it's really wild to watch people who are otherwise fit. They'll fool you with the way they walk. They won't fool you with the way they run because when we lean forward to jog, we use a little more ankle. When we lean further forward to run, we use a little more ankle. And by the time you're in a full-on sprint or hiking up a really steep hill, you're using a lot of ankle. So when we watch people that seem to walk good, but the wheels fall off when they run, that's exactly what we're seeing. So is it of your opinion? And that's what this is, your opinion, that if you identify someone with an ankle mobility restriction, is a good first place to start just have them walk on a balance beam? That I Forget f- pain. I'm not going to say pain. Yeah. It's a stiff ankle. No, I think it's a heck of an idea, and it's been part of, part of our correctives. As a matter of fact, one of the, fl- the, the, the mobility flow that we've got up on the website, which is just you and a half foam roll, and I've done this with a lot of organized football programs and stuff, is we'll do that flow and then walk on a balance beam, meaning let's clean out all the junk that your system has accumulated from mini camp or whatever else we're doing, and then get on a balance beam. Because if you don't challenge the balance beam after creating some mobility and awareness, you don't ever hit save on the document. But the central nervous system will use that mobility on the balance beam so you can use better stability, and it all happens behind the scene. You so don't have to I, think about it. The reason I was leading you to that place, Gray, wasn't I wasn't looking for you to say the balance beam. I was looking for you to say you balance beam is part of it. You can't just do the balance beam and think it's going to fix your ankle mobility restriction. Right. It well, is a kind of the cherry on top. It's where you put it all together, right? Well, also in in the way you you said it, I will introduce the balance beam to give them the baseline. So let's say we did a movement screen on a few people saw a hurdle step problem. I will actually not tell them they got a bad hurdle step or single leg stance. I'll send them over to the balance beam. They don't do very well. When we do the corrective that helps their single leg stance, whether it's to fix their ankle mobility or get their hip under them, it doesn't matter what it is. Without practicing the balance beam, they go back to the balance beam and they go, whoa, that's way better. Well, I think one thing you said there, when you get on that balance beam, that sometimes people, because we're talking about the ankle, you said, and I think it's very important to bring it back up and discuss it, is what happens to the foot. The foot, in essence, goes into pronation. When you put the foot in pronation, that's kind of like grabbing the ground or what I think, I may, I may miss it, but I think Vladimir Yonder termed short foot posturing. Well, that is really done to create better proprioceptive input. It's like trying to do a push-up with your hands flat on the ground. You're not going to do it. And as soon as you go into pronation, or excuse me, supination of the foot, yes. not pronation. I said supination. It should be supination of the foot. But if you go into pronation, the first thing you're going to see the knee do is collapse. Exactly. And one of the things that, that Pavel talked about in his book, The Naked Warrior, which is all about doing a single leg squat or one arm push up, is you almost screw the extremity into the ground. In both cases, whether you're doing a one arm push up or a pistol with your foot, screwing it into the ground creates supination. That supination then follows all the way up the chain and, and almost pushes you right out. So there's a right way to hit something with your fist and a wrong way to hit something with your fist. And there's a right way to hit the ground with your foot and there's a wrong way to hit the ground with your foot. And pronation is bad in both cases and a slight supination is good in both cases. So let me take it one step further. And this is what I would think you'd agree with with doing some balance beam work barefoot is you, the next area that becomes dysfunctional going more distally is the big toe. Because mm-hmm. if you don't have that, that first metatarsal phalangeal joint always gets neglected, 
People don't want to toe off. People don't toe off. They don't use their ankle. Don't use your ankle. Don't use your hip. So again, it's that kinetic chain. But that big toe, when you're doing a balance beam, you start really stepping out or striding, walking backwards. You got to get that big toe involved. And and I think if we don't talk about it too much, the person will actually figure out how to use their foot. And I think talking during that process devalues the way the central nervous system does it. So it, when, when Lee and I do correctives sometimes, the class that we're teaching makes us talk during the thing. But in real life therapy and, and, and rehabilitation, we don't talk. We let the obstacle speak to you and we watch the way you adapt. And if you're not adapting or responding well, I will... I will reduce the obstacle before I give you the answer. I, 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 or, or I'll reduce your posture. But I won't tell you how to do it if you can't figure out the obstacle. I just simply limit the obstacle a little bit more because I know that if you find the answer on your own, uh, biomechanically, kinesiologically speaking, it's in there. And if I got to give it to you, it's gone when you slam the door behind you. So, Well, well that's like you said. In exercise, that's what you'll do for corrections. And if you've got a stiffness, but now you've got somebody who's in pain, the same scenario may not work. So you're going to have to get in there and do something, whether it's to the ankle or the foot. I mean, if somebody's coming in and, you know, I think Ashley kicked it off by saying she's been trying to get ankle mobility for a long time. At some point, you've got to do something different. And that's why it's important to set the baseline and continue to recheck it. You would be surprised how many people that I've treated across my career with low back pain where I was able to introduce a balance beam the first or second day. Because walking narrow, even though it challenged their balance and made them go unbelievably slow, did not cause them low back pain. And these are people that I saw in the SFMA that would have problems flexing, extending, or rotating their back. But when I looked at their single leg stance, they didn't have pain but on one side, they could barely balance for five seconds. Now, I've got two choices as a therapist. I could say, I want you to practice balancing on your left leg because it's very poor. Or I realize that 50% of the balance beam is going to be that, and they will simply have to slow down. When we see something in many of these people that improves their single leg stance without, without consciously practicing it, they also pick up a little bit more range of motion. So that's what we talk about in SFMA when we say not all dysfunctional movements are painful and not all painful movements are dysfunctional. Sometimes you move fine in your squat, but it hurts your knee. And sometimes you balance poorly, but it doesn't hurt your back. What that means to me is while I'm treating your back in the planes of motion where it's painful to move, I can be sending you home with balance exercises that are only going to give me a better platform with which to reinstall mm -hmm. your back range of motion. So I think that we often miss opportunities to assign very, very good obstacle-based exercises just because we're so scared we're going to flare up the low back. I already know single leg stance doesn't flare up your low back. The SFMA told me so. So I have a, a window of opportunity to start your rehabilitation while you're still having low back pain without exacerbating it or putting you at greater risk. And now it's time for our fireside chat with Gray Cook. Today, I want to talk about the word compensation. If, if you've been on my side of most of the questions that have been guided my way for, for my career, compensation comes up, uh, you know, whether it's in rehabilitation, some corrective move, or even high-end conditioning. Compensation uh, is really our way of saying somebody's trying to move well, but they're not. They're using the wrong body parts, the wrong posture, the wrong pattern, the wrong range of motion. They're doing something wrong, but they're having a mild degree of success. But I realize if I keep letting them move this way, we're going to have a problem. Totally get it. Now, let me take it a little bit deeper. The whole movement screen and movement assessment uh, journey started for me in that if you can't do some of these moves, there's no way you're doing those without compensation because if it's not available to you in this body weight, 
you know, movement pattern platform, you're not going to summon it up during stress or exercise or volume or intensity. So what I'm seeing when you you screen poorly or assess poorly from a functional standpoint is you're going to compensate if we give you a chance. And let's just go deep. Compensation is a biological imperative, okay? Our ancestors, if they had a hurt foot and still needed to get from point A to point B, they limped. A limp is basically a longer stride uh, on your shorts uh, on your painful side and a longer stance time on your good side. And when you're in pain, a limp will actually let you cover more distance in less pain than trying to walk without a limp. But what happens when the pain is gone? Some of us still limp. Now, that's a very easy example, but when we've had a back injury, some of us still slouch. When we've had a neck injury, some of us don't turn the same way every time. And so a lot of these compensations, even though the thing that started the problem is gone, the compensations are there. Many times we can find that and realize, oh, you move poorly, but there's no bad part under this. We've got to really find that groove. But when we assign the exercise and we see compensation, we got to start owning that. Because if you had a chance to assign the exercise, you should have already known if compensation is going to occur or not. So at, at, a, at a one day in my career, I stopped seeing compensation as something they do and something, and started seeing it as something I caused. Now, if you're not on my watch, if I'm not your trainer, your coach, your, your um, therapist, then you got to do what you got to do. That's, that's on you. But the minute I'm calling the shots, if you're still compensating and I'm having to coach you out of it, I called the wrong move. And one of the things that I started doing is when you see somebody moving poorly, compensating, valgus collapse, pronation, bad back position, whatever it is that you're catching and calling compensation, you've got two choices. And if you if you think you got more than that, just think deeply about it. You can either coach the pattern or change the posture. So I'm either going to tell you how to do a chop and lift standing, half kneeling, or sitting, or I'm going to lay you flat on your back and let your spine be totally aligned and then let you do it that way. So in FMS, a lot of our corrective strategy came from let's not overcoach the pattern. Let's reduce the postural load. What does that mean? Instead of standing up, you're kneeling. Instead of kneeling, you're sitting. Instead of sitting, you're quadruped. Instead of quadruped, you're lying. And so we reduce your postures and see if you can still do the same same pattern. And we see that. But I want you to understand, we are biologically wired to compensate because it's a survival mechanism. On a bad day, sometimes you still got to cover distance. Sometimes you still got to lift things. Just because you got a tendonitis doesn't mean you don't pick up your baby. You're still doing that. But it's when we assign the exercise, we assign the protocol, the rehab, the program, and we see compensation, you misprogrammed. I misprogrammed. If I'm having to overcoach a movement I put you on, I have not pre-scaled that movement to you. And I'm not talking about throwing a curveball or something. I'm not talking about a highly skilled movement. I'm talking about push, pull, hinge, squat, lunge, lift, bend, things like that. If I'm having to coach it as if you're striping a golf ball or throwing a javelin, then I gave you something too complex and I'm trying to talk you out of compensation and I've already set you up up for it in the task that I ask you to do. So once we've screened or assessed somebody, if you're still seeing significant amounts of compensation in the move that you're assigning, you got to get a bigger playbook of movement or you got to look a little bit deeper in how you're trying to correct something. And sometimes you got to put your hands on people. And if you're a trainer and that's not, that's not possible or you're a coach, you need to know when to make the good referral to the right soft tissue person, the right therapist, uh, athletic trainer, chiropractor to jumpstart this system to reduce compensation. So if there's an active injury or pain, I want you to compensate because walking with a rock in your shoe is not supposed to be comfortable even if you cover it up. And that's what I'm saying. If there's pain under there, then compensation is going to always occur. It's a, it's a subconscious biological drive. If there is no pain and you're still seeing compensation, 
you didn't screen thoroughly enough to understand where you need to put them on this journey. So I've got to get you moving without compensation and then slowly progress you back up through your functional positions, understanding that you're going to try to bring that on if I don't let you forget how you were doing it wrong the first time. So we see the word compensation come up and we talk about it as if it's their problem. The minute they're paying you, any compensation they do is on you and your first remedy shouldn't be to coach it out. It should be to program it out by understanding when and why they're going to compensate and don't even give them an excuse to. So when we talk about some of our principles, protect before we correct, correct before we develop, I'm saying protect them from situations where they will have to compensate because all they're going to do is memorize that better than the lesson plan of movement authenticity. So we hear ourselves using the word compensation a lot, but at one point I started saying, I'm causing it because I'm trying to get you to exercise in a way that you're not ready for. And that's me making exercise the subject of this relationship instead of what it takes to make you move better. Exercise is my tool. I hope that helps and start thinking about that. Your eye, if it's good enough to be enjoying this podcast, it's probably better than most. You're going to see compensation everywhere. Own the stuff that you can own. Let the rest go. But definitely compensation on your watch is your problem, not theirs. That'll do it for this episode of The Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.